portrayals throughout this presentation. I've been working in the industry for nearly 20 years and I've seen trails evolve and grow. And I think having stepped into the consulting world, I was able to continue my passion and take it from just putting a trail on the ground to actually creating trails as a product and as an anchor for communities. And so that's what I'm gonna be here to talk to you about today is how you can take the trail within your community and create opportunities that your community both tourists and residents can benefit from. I do want to just acknowledge the fact that I have lived in every province in Atlantic Canada, so I do have a clear understanding of what's going on, hopefully in most of the provinces. And when I was working for TransCanada Trail, obviously I worked in all of the provinces. I most recently lived in Newfoundland prior to this um, and lived in Paradise for three and a half years. And when we were living in Newfoundland, I took the opportunity to be a tourist in my own province. So. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to Labrador, but I got throughout the entire um, island of, of Newfoundland and was able to appreciate and visit a lot of the trails. And then, of course, um, I went to University of Nova Scotia. My husband's from Nova Scotia. I went to college in Prince Edward Island. I got married in Prince Edward Island. And I now live here and grew up in New Brunswick. So hopefully I can um, impart some of my knowledge and, and, and understanding of your provinces and hopefully some of the unique experiences and challenges that you might be facing. Um, I will say that I do have four cats and so although I hope they won't pop in, you may see a cat's tail crawl across my, my desk. Um, so just a little bit more about what I've been doing for work. So I am a consultant. My primary focus is trail tourism and community engagement. I'm currently working with the provincial government of New Brunswick to develop a, government's, a trail governance model at the moment. Um, I'm also working with the TransCanada Trail to develop a Greenway assessment tool. Um, I noticed Nancy's on the call. I worked with Rustigush to develop a mountain bike destination project and recently pre uh, presented to the Rustigush Tourism Association. I'm also working on an active transportation plan for the city of Moncton. Um, I'm working with the Canadian Trails Federation to develop a strategic, strategic direction plan. And I've been working on a linear park project with Halliburton County Trail. So I've got my hands on a bunch of different things. Um, I've also worked with Bi Bicycle Nova Scotia to develop their Bike Friendly Nova Scotia program worked with the provincial government here in New Brunswick to develop their signature trail program. And I also was the president of Atlantic Canada Trails. And in that role, we worked to develop a destination trail assessment tool, which assessed a lot of the trails in, in Atlantic Canada. And um, I worked with many of the stakeholders throughout Atlantic Canada on that project. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go through this presentation. Um, as Jonathan said, we're gonna to try to keep it as informal as possible. So if there are questions that, you know, if you have a burning question, Feel free to pop, you know, um, open up your mic and have a conversation with me. Otherwise, just pop it in the chat box and we'll be able to address them at the end. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is capitalizing on the trail economy. We know that during the pandemic, people have been going to the trails and droves, and that's probably been the saving grace for a lot of people during the pandemic because it's given them an opportunity to get out and actually get some fresh air and take some time away from the screen time and the Zoom fatigue. Um, so I am gonna be speaking primarily from a business and operator perspective, but I do know there's some trail groups on this call. So what I'm hoping you'll get from this is how you can speak to your business and community groups on how they can capitalize on your trail products. So whether it's the East Coast Trail or um, Hillary working on the trails in and around Truro. Um, it'll give you an opportunity on how you can speak to your business community or your, or your service community on how they may be able to um, use the trail to their benefit because I think that this is the missing link. We're not right now connecting business to the trail and I think we have a huge opportunity to do so. So just go to the next slide. So why are we talking about trails? Well, I think of course, during the, as I mentioned before, during the pandemic, so many people have been going to the trails and the numbers speak for themselves. So there's been numerous studies that have been taken uh, uh, as a result of the pandemic. And TransCanada Trail did one that indicated that, you know, people are going to the trail for fitness, outdoors, enjoy nature, relaxation, mental wellness, mental health and wellness. And then the Rails to Trails Conservancy also did a study um, that 46% of the respondents noted that access to open space had reduced levels of stress and 66% of them indicated that they were getting outside at the same level or greater. Jane, and then here, yep. Um, you, you actually didn't share your screen yet, so. Oh, sorry, okay. No 
no problem. Sorry. There we go. No wonder. Okay. Where did I, I lost my, I lost my screen now. Okay. Okay. Now just sorry. I lost the screen. See, it, it always happens this way. We had it all prepped and ready to roll. Yeah. And <laughs> all right. So now it's coming up. Oh, I'm going to move this over here because that's the way I want it to do. Okay. There you go. You have the screen up now? Uh, I have your, your lap there. Okay. Uh, but move this over here and then I'm going to push this up. It's your uh, laptop. Yeah. Screen. Yeah. I'm going to do this now. There we go. Nope. No. Oh, share. oh, I hit share. There. there you go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good to go. All right. Awesome. So let's start again. So why trail? So again, this is just a snapshot of some of the studies that have been done. Um, a lot of organizations decided that they wanted to measure um, how many people were using the trail and why they were using the trail. So there's been numerous studies done, as I said, Trans-Canada Trail, Rails to Trails Conservancy and Recreation New Brunswick. However, anecdotally, I've been speaking to a lot of people that feel like this is going to continue and the trend is only going to grow. Um, some of you may know John McNair who owns Outdoor Elements in Sussex. I was just talking to John last week and he said that um, this has been his best year in terms of um, the, the, the business that they've been having at their store. Um, you know, bike shops have been running out of bikes and outdoor, outdoor or trail related equipment has been flying off the shelves. So we know based on that, that trails are really going to continue to grow and that we do need to capitalize on this trend. I mean, obviously we don't, we, you know, the, the pandemic has not been great, but if anything, it has shown the value and need for people to get outside and appreciate the outdoors. And it's really been uh, a huge boost to the trail, um, trail industry and sector. So one thing that I do want to talk about a little bit is that the, import, the importance of community. So we are obviously talking about this from a tourism perspective, but we can't take for granted the community that you live in and the importance of the people within the community because they're the ones that sustain the trail year round. So regardless of whether you, know, you have a huge influx of people in the summer to go hike your trail or you have a snowmobile trail and people go there in the winter, the people that live in your community are going to be the ones that sustain the trail. And they are, and then in what we want to do is have the trail become the heart of the community. So being that place where people congregate and come together and see the value of it. And that the community sees the trail as an opportunity to showcase their assets. One thing that I've seen um, as a really important factor is that the residents become the ambassadors for your trail. So whether you're um, somebody who's hosting a family, whether you're, you know, have family coming in, they start talking about the trail because it be, it's such an important part of their community. So we can't under, under, I can't understate the value and importance of the community um, and how they need to be engaged in this. So it's not just getting the businesses engaged, you need to get the people and the, and, and the families um, using the trail and speaking about the trail and, um, you know, valuing the trail. So what is the trail economy? So the trail economy is the idea of generating both indirect and direct revenue through the development and promotion of a trail as a product. So what we have to do is think about a trail as a product and not just simply a piece of infrastructure in the community. Um, so what we're trying to do is elevate that product and taking it to the next level. Not every trail will be a tourism product. Um, a lot of trail, a lot of really great trail is a recreational asset and a very valuable recreational asset. But for those trails that can provide an economic impact from a trail, from a tourism perspective, we need to elevate those and see them as a product. So this doesn't just mean building the trail. Obviously, building the trail does provide economic impact to the area and provides employment, but it is also looking at all the other assets. And that's what we're going to talk about is how we actually um, see economic impact through the trail for businesses and services within the community. So what are some of the potential impacts of the trail economy? Well, of course, it's going to create economic growth and we've seen that happen in so many communities. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Great Allegheny Passage and I tend not to talk about that when we're talking at Atlantic Canada because 
their numbers are huge. They're, you know, they're generating 40, $50 million a year. Um, we certainly don't have the draw that they do, um, but it certainly will have an economic impact. And I'm gonna speak a little bit about that later on. It grows local businesses and creates jobs. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit later about business diversification and the new unique partnerships that we can create um, through the trail economy. Um, interestingly enough, just again, from the Great Allegheny Passage perspective, the first 10 years of the Trail Town program netted 65 new businesses and 270 jobs. So we can see that and it's a matter of being creative and looking at how we can make things grow. Um, it compounds the trail's economic potential. It improves infrastructure in rural areas. So if you're starting to see the trail as an economic impact, you will start improving the infrastructure because that trail not only is a tourism product, it could be an active transportation route within your community and becomes that main route. And so if more people are coming to the area to use the trail, then you're obviously going to want to continue to improve that trail. And then it protects the trails and surrounding nature. So we certainly see a lot of impacts from the trail economy. Um, as I said, I lived in Newfoundland and I know there's, uh, there's a representation from the East Coast Trail. So this is Kitty Vitty Village, which I think is a great opportunity for partnership. And obviously um, this is a trailhead from one of the trails when we were out hiking when we lived there. Some of the additional benefits from trails are increased sale tax revenue, private and public investment, employment and property assessments. So we know that trails do in increase property, um, uh, property assessments along the trail. We're leveraging targeted funding for trail related projects. And so we know during the pandemic times that there's going to be a lot of trail related projects. There was just one project funding an announcement for um, community investment that could allow for trail improvements, et cetera. Trails also improve community aesthetics and atmosphere, attracts new residents, which I think we all want to see happen in our communities, proven method of revitalizing small communities and helps bring a song, strong sense of community pride. And I think that's really important for us to think about is that when um, the Trail Town program was developed, it was actually based around the Main Street program, which was a program used to develop and improve downtown areas and, and revitalize sad and, and sort of, um, you know, downtown areas that were petering out and not being used when people started going out to the suburbs and building um, big malls and big box stores. And so they were trying to revitalize the same downtowns and that program had a huge impact. And so I think the same thing can happen through our, through the development and improvement of our trails. Um, so again, trails do provide economic impact. I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but there's certainly a lot of studies that show that when trails are seen as a tourism product, they can see a lot of economic impact within the regions. Um, so we talk about Fredericton trails, uh, you know, that's, that's a huge, that's 80 kilometer network of trails, $6.6 .6 million in spending, and there's a multiple other trails. And so I think that, you know, we, we do have to recognize that trails do provide an economic impact and that they are important um, and that we need to recognize that, you know, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland have a vast trail network and we haven't done a good job and seen the return on investment. And so we really do need to capitalize on that and start seeing an impact from them. So now I'm gonna get into the nuts and bolts about what trail users are looking for and some of the things that we could do to diversify business products and, and how we might be able to partner with um, other organizations and businesses to create um, a trail economy within your area. So I'm speaking generally from a trail user perspective. So generally speaking, whether it's a hiker, a biker, um, snowmobiler, et cetera, they're generally looking for a lot of the same things. Most of the work that I do is with the non-motorized communities. So I generally speak from a hiking and cycling perspective, but I have worked with the ATV and snowmobile community as well. These are less um, important to them, but there is still some opportunity there as well. So we know that they're looking for good food and gastronomic experiences. They want to come to the area and experience local food, get to know the people and the, and the, and, uh, the farmers that are producing the food. They want authentic artisan experiences. Again, these people wanna come into your community and get to know the community. Um, 
a lot of times we know that trails tell stories, trails have experiences, you know, trails are de developed because they're on an old abandoned rail bed that has a story. Um, they might be on an old um, portage route, whether it's, um, you know, a, a historic portage route, etc. And so there's history there, but then there's also history within those communities that people want to learn about. So there's, you know, authentic artisan experiences, craft beer, cider, and ice cream. This is proven. We know that they love to have craft beer and cider and ice cream, interestingly enough, is something that they really love as well. A sense of whimsy. So they wanna have unique experiences. They wanna be able to take pictures, Instagrammable opportunities. We know that people are populating their Instagram feeds with great outdoor experiences. And so having something unique to offer them, whether it's a, it's a, you know, a beautiful view shed that's got something there that they can take a picture of, or whether there's a unique sculpture, et cetera, that's what they're looking for. And they're looking for a wide variety of accommodations. Oftentimes I hear from people, well, we live in a small community and we don't have a big hotel, um, but that's not necessarily what they're looking for. And quite frankly, um, most of them aren't. They're looking for inns because they wanna to get to know the innkeeper. They're looking for something like glamping or a yurt or even camping. So when people come to me and say, well, we don't have enough of, uh, you know, enough hotels or, or things like that. I would say think outside the box and look at something different because they're not going to be looking for a holiday and some maybe, but that's really not the experience they're looking for. And in a study that was done by the Belle de Blue, which is a, a wonderful trail in Quebec, um, they identified activities that they wanted to do off the trail. So, and that would keep them in the area longer. Um, they're looking for museums, beaches, and outdoor activities such as paddling, fishing, and golfing. Well, you couldn't come to a better place than Atlantic Canada for all of these things. And so think about how you can couple and, and package those opportunities because people are coming to hike, people are coming to cycle, but they also like to do other things. And so what can we do to keep them in the area a little bit longer? Could they go biking for the morning, come into a community and go golfing or go paddling? So we need to start looking at partnership and opportunities. And obviously I spoke again earlier about authentic experiences. So what is the region known for? What can you do to be able to tell the story of the region, whether it's through the food that they eat, the authentic artisan experiences, um, et cetera. They wanna feel like they're part of the place that they're visiting. They want to immerse themselves in your community, in your region, and that's what they're going to take home with them. So don't be afraid to go all out and give them and tell them the stories of your communities. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about opportunities for partnerships and business diversification, because I think this is where we need to start thinking outside the box. So traditionally we're thinking about, okay, they're coming to the trail, they're gonna need a place to eat, they're gonna need a place to sleep, um, and that's about it. But as I said earlier, they want to start doing different things. And so think about theming and experiences. Identify themes that we can carry throughout the entire trail experience and region. So if your region has a particular, you know, whether it's agriculture, whether it's artisans, et cetera, think about how you can package the experiences and create something that throughout that trail opportunity, um, they are able to see something along each part of the stop. So whether they're going from community to community, there's something that ties them to that experience. So whether it's, um, I, again, Confederation Trail in Prince Edward Island, we're talking about different, uh, different opportunities. And so we're talking about agriculture. So they go into the communities and each restaurant perhaps has a meal that's related to the agriculture in that area. So whether it's potatoes or mussels or, or whatever the case may be, there's a consistent theme throughout the area. Think beyond the trail. So not everything has to be trail based. There are a lot of really great things that are off the trail that people might not know about, but it, it's a hidden, it's a hidden asset. So think about beyond it. So things, you know, oftentimes they'll say, well, we want to keep things within one to five kilometers from the trail. Well, that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can start clustering and, and creating partnership opportunities and packages, but think about things that are off the trail that will keep people in the area for a little bit longer. Um, community partnerships to engage, engage residents. So 
as I said earlier, residents are your best ambassadors. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can engage your business, your communities uh, and the residents to get them out there talking about the trail, um, whether they're out and, and they're in the community and, and they meet somebody and, and they can say, hey, you know, you might not be here to go hiking, but did you know that there's this great trail that just, you know, two kilometers away that, you know, and that'll keep them in the area for a couple extra days. Connecting attractions and cultivating assets that are non-traditional. So again, farm tours, gastro tours, local festivals. Think about partnering with things that are in your area that again, might not be traditional. So there might be a festival in your area, whether, and I remember um, one time working in New Brunswick on a, with a group and they had a bluegrass festival. Well, what they did was they actually got some of the bluegrass um, players, uh, you know, banjo player and whatnot out on the trail and taking people for a hike. So think about how you can partner with local festivals or farm tours and then casual and experience based opportunities. So again, lobster dinners, Kaylee's, we have these great opportunities. So maybe there's an opportunity for people to go hiking and then that evening they go in for a lobster dinner or there's a Kaylee taking place and you can package those things and create these opportunities that are memorable for the people that are in the area because as I said they want to see and learn about what you have to offer and so they're willing to take that extra time to stay in the area and and you know and learn about what you have to offer so here's some opportunities for business diversification and again we'll talk a little bit i'm hoping we can brainstorm and think about some different ideas but perhaps you're an existing inner bed and breakfast um, and you can make your establishment a little bit more desirable by adding bicycle storage lockers or you could provide a high, high carb bag lunch for guests so they could take it with them in the morning and head out on the trail. Um, restaurants could offer special meals and they could have, offer things like a gourmet picnic lunch. So they could go to, the, go to your restaurant in the morning, pick up their bagged lunch and head off on their trail experience and have something that's memorable, that's packed with things that are local, whether you, know, you have um, you know, lobster sandwiches and, and local produce and those types of things and take that with them and maybe you can give them you know, a, a, a blanket that goes in that's embroidered with something from your business. Um, and create something people are willing to pay for that and willing to take that out on the trail with them. And then, as I said, there are many local festivals. There could be a unique opportunity to connect community trails to the festivals to create an on-trail component. And I've seen that work and I, mean, I know we've got trail tales and tunes and those types of things. So I think there's some more opportunities that we could, could look at to create something unique specific to your I, area. I was just sharing, Jane, uh, put it in the chat, but uh, we had Chris Shepard on, uh, couple of sessions ago mm -hmm. he was just sharing um you know what they did with the roots rants and roars festival yeah and exactly what you're talking about they partnered with local restaurants to create these incredible uh picnic lunches that you would pick up from the restaurant and then take out onto the trail and then they had uh preset areas where you could actually download from spotify some of the artisans this was their um response to the whole COVID thing instead of yeah. losing the festival and how they could use their trails connect with their businesses um it was incredible it just uh it, it, like they sold out of all these picnic lunches and now you're seeing it across the whole island and it, it was funny people uh, that were on the call from New Brunswick Nova Scotia and PER were like trying to find out from him where they were getting these backpacks and all of this stuff so it's it's incredible what uh, what you can do by uh, some very simple pieces to get people out and about on the trails. That's the thing. And that's what I want people to understand is this doesn't require a huge investment of money. This just requires thinking a little bit outside the box and doing something that's just slightly non-traditional. And people are willing to pay for it. So you might invest in buying that blanket, but you add that on the cost and people are willing to take because that's something they'll take home with them and they'll remember that from their trip. And so I think it's, you know, a lot of people think it's going to be a huge cost to their business. Uh, and there's certainly things that will cost a lot. You know, if you want to add a bicycle storage locker, you could start with just a shed, but then it could grow into something bigger. Um, but you don't have to start big. You can start small and start to grow that as you start to see the demand increase. Um, here are some ideas that people have been doing. And this is just things that people have done. And I know, you know, there's people here from, um, from, uh, from Newfoundland. And so we, when we lived in Newfoundland, we went out to the Bonavista Peninsula. And one of the neat things uh, was when we stayed at Fisher's Loft, 
um, we were hiking the Skirling Trail and there was, there was, you know, hiking sticks and, and trail mix in the room. And that just made us feel great because it looked like, you know, we could just grab that and take it with us. It was not a lot of extra work to be able to put that into the room and have it there, but it made me feel appreciated because I was going to take that and, and go out in the trail. And I, I absolutely still remember that. And that was five years ago and it was a great experience. Um, Steve beer on the rum runners trail. Um, so we were, we were, uh, down in, um, down on the rum runners trail a couple of years ago. And there's a section of the rum runners trail, which is a number of different trails in the South shore of Nova Scotia. And one of the sections is D the dynamite trail and they created the dynamite trail ale. And I know that, um, one of the beer packages that they do, they did across co the country. There was a Skirwink haze, I think that port, uh, that they had done. So I think for in Newfoundland, so I think there's you know, Port Ruxton Brewery rather. And so I think there's opportunities there. There's the bike and bean on the Rum Runners Trail in Nova Scotia and, and they've been ahead of the curve for years. Um, there were cafe and bicycle shops. So that's an old rail station that they created um, and turned into a bike, a, a bike shop and cafe. So you can go in and you'll see all the bikes there. Um, you can go in and have a coffee, you can get your bike serviced, you can pick up things. It's such a neat little spot. And I think, you know, those are opportunities. There's still some abandoned rail stations along the trail or even just, um, you know, a, a shed or, 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 you know, I've been talking to groups um, about using shipping containers or using, um, you know, little outbuildings. Um, so those things can be modified and it could be a hiker's hut and you could have people come in and they could have a coffee um, and, and they could, you know, if they need to pick up a couple things for their hiking kit because they were out there, they could do something like that. Um, there's the Mabu River Inn, which is on the Celtic Shores Coastal Trail. Um, they have a private access to the trail. So people, you know, people can come in and off the trail. Um, they offer bike rentals for their guests. And um, so that, again, um, is a great opportunity. And it really hasn't done a whole, you know, hasn't increased the cost to their business. Um, it's actually enhanced their business. And then this is something that's done in Riverview or was done through the Biosphere Review uh, River, uh, Reserve at their library. But I was thinking that this is something that could be done at your business as well. So they have these discovery day packs that you could actually go to the library and take out and it's got a bunch of different things in it. So it's got, you know, magnifying glass, compass um, and different things to, to go out and explore the Funday Biosphere Re Reserve. So they've got the amazing places a program on their on their trail network within the within the area but if you were an inn you could have a backpack that's got all these great tools that people could take out and that's great to have if you had a family um, and said hey you know what here's a great little tool that you can go out and maybe there's some flora and fauna on the trail uh, and and that again just creates that memorable experience for people and it really makes them feel appreciated that there's something there for them and they're, 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 you know, they're thinking about the trail users that are coming into the area. So here's some opportunities, um, of potential scenarios. So again, I know what I I'm hoping you start to think about is think about your communities and what you might be able to connect together to create some memorable experience as, and partnership opportunities. So think about within your town or your community is there a local restaurant, local accommodation, and local artisan that you could create a unique partnership that could keep people in the area? So maybe it's you come to the area and stay there. Um, you're going to go for a hike in the morning and the local restaurant provides you with a bagged lunch. And then you're going to come back in the afternoon and you're going to do a workshop and you're going to learn how to um, paint or whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's an Indigenous community and you're going to do something that's locally made there. Whatever the case may be, or maybe it's it's learning how to cook. Maybe you're going to go foraging, and when you're out on the trail, and you come back and you make something with that meal, and then within the region, I talked about the experience doesn't have to be on the trail or within that five kilometer reach. So maybe you're partnering with a local restaurant. They're going to provide you with a meal, and then you're going to go to um, an experiential business outside of town with a local shuttle shuttle driver. So that creates a business opportunity for the local shuttle driver who is able to take people out to um, the outfitter. So maybe they're gonna go paddling for the afternoon and then they're gonna come back and have dinner at the restaurant. So there's lots of opportunity to think about and how you can create those packages to keep people there. Because as I said, 
they're, they want to stay in the area. And we know that most people will spend if the opportunities are there and it's been proven. And, and so, you know, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, some people are just going to go and they want to go hike and that's it. But there are other people that are willing to spend the money. And I think we need to start catering to those people because we are missing out on that opportunity. So this is what I always like to tell people is why should you capitalize on developing a trail economy? Because there aren't cash registers on the trail. So if you want to boost um, your local economy, you have to tap into the town and into the act opportunity actively. So you can pedal your whole community forward by transforming into a trail friendly destination where people want to stay, explore and spend. So it really is a matter of getting people off the trail. You've already got them coming to your community and using the trail. You need to get them off the trail and get them into your community, have an authentic experience and capitalize on that trail economy because the potential is there and we just simply haven't tapped into it enough. And we really are missing out on something that provinces like Ontario, like Quebec have been, have been benefiting from for many, many years. And, you know, there's a lot of great experiences and, and, and um, um, examples um, throughout North America. And, and we're starting to see it here in Atlantic Canada, but we need to do more and we need to start tapping into it. So now um, I'd love to open it up for conversations. I don't know whether Jonathan's had any questions or comments, but and I do have a couple of other slides. If people have, you know, if people are stuck for ideas, I do have some additional slides here, but I'd love to have a conversation with people and hear about what your thoughts are, what you're doing, because Jonathan and I have talked about the potential here and we really feel like we've got a lot of opportunities. Um, I know here in New Brunswick, we're developing an extensive signature trail network. I know in Nova Scotia, there's Celtic Shores, there's Rum Runners, there's Harvest Moon. There's lots of great experiences there. There's also hiking trails. No Newfoundland's got the Grand Concourse. There's the East Coast Trail. There's lots of other trail networks, Bonavista Peninsula uh, and Great Northern Peninsula. And so we've got the experiences here and now it's just a matter of keeping people here and getting them to spend the money and learn about what we have to offer in our beautiful um, provinces. Thank Jane, you. that was amazing. Uh, Laura, you got a question? Yeah, that, it was amazing, Jane. It's, uh, you know, I think often our, our barrier sometimes to this stuff is our own culture mindset. Yeah. So here in Newfoundland, as you know, we have amazing trails from the East Coast trails and the concourse and like you mentioned, but um, you know, it's interesting. We're not a very well known as a biking culture. Mm -hmm. So last year, my cousin who owns um, Bonavista Picnics, uh, she owned a cafe up there in Bonavista. She ran it and she went with this bicycle idea. I mean, it exploded. So she would pack the lunch in with, for the bicycle with the family. And I mean, she was buying bikes in the middle of the summer. Yeah. Um, and you know, I love what you're talking about because it's not just for the business owner to create. It's not like I, someone needs to start a business doing it as much as it is that those connections, right? So whether you're like the, like you said, the trails and tunes um, in Bay Roberts, like sometimes it's hard to initiate that entrepreneurship for people to start it. So the town started it yep. and they're more than willing to give it to anyone who wants to do it. Yeah. Right. But you know, so it's whether you're the restaurant or whether you're the cafe or whether you're the community, you know, um, as, as part of the council or you're part of, it's just such an opportunity for so many businesses. And I think, you know, here, like you say, our trails are so um, under sort of exposed. And when people travel here, unless you're coming here as a hiker, it's very difficult to find out where to go and what to do, yeah. where yeah. these trails are and how to access them. So I think having the opportunity where it's laid out, especially in Jonathan and I, oh, sorry, I lost connection there. But Jonathan and I talk all the time about just plan it all for us. We just want to show up with our kids and like have two hours planned out whether you're going to do something and you're going to feed them. And, you know, yeah. So, anyway, very inspiring. It's so many opportunities for so many others involved. Well, and I think you're right, Lori, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's that one champion. So Bay Roberts stepped in and took it on, you know, and, and it is the idea of finding that person or that group or that organization that's willing to take the chance and jump at it and do it. 
And so oftentimes, and it's interesting because I was speaking to, and some of you probably know John and may have been on the, may have been on his presentation, but John McNair and I were talking about how we can take Sussex and create that opportunity. And he said, well, is it the Sussex, Sussex and Area Trails Association or is it our outdoor corridor group? That's the sort of the business community. And I said, you figure out what the best one is, who's going to be the champion. And so it's finding those champions that are willing to take that and then bringing the right people around and showing them the opportunities that are there. And I think that, you know, we've talked about this for so many years and, uh, you know, I've been involved in trails for 20 years. I think 20 years ago, I was developing these destination trail concepts and plans. We have been talking about it for so long. It's now, it's just a matter of doing it and getting out there and not being being uh, afraid to do it because I think that's the thing too is oftentimes we second guess ourselves because that's what we do here in Atlantic Canada as well I'm not sure whether we're ready or is our trail ready or are we are we good enough and it's just a matter of getting it's like what your cousin did and, and all of a sudden it exploded and it's just having that that ability to just jump at it and do it and I think that if we can start doing it and that's what Jonathan and I have been talking about is finding some champions, finding some communities that would be willing to start creating these experiences so that the rest of the people in Atlantic Canada can start seeing how it's growing. So um, I'm working with a group here in New Brunswick up in, in, in the, the Acadian Peninsula, and they've really just said, you know what, we're not waiting for the province of New Brunswick to provide us with funding. We're going to do it on our own and hopefully they'll show people by example that it can be done by a group of people and they're just willing to take that 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 leap of faith and, and taking it on. And as I said, oftentimes too, it, people think I need a lot of money. Well, you, you know, oftentimes people can access bikes, whether it's a secondhand bike, whether it's an RCMP, oftentimes they'll have bikes that are available because people, have, they've been stolen, they've been dropped off at the RCMP station. And they might just, you know, people aren't looking for, if people are looking for a, a fancy bike, they're probably bringing it themselves. So a lot of people that might just want to go on a little bike ride around the community, they don't need to be fancy to begin with. And so I think that's oftentimes becomes a barrier for us as well. So uh, yeah, that's great. I, I don't want to capitalize on the conversation because I'm sure there's other people that have other things to say. As I said, I get passionate and excited because I know we've got so much to offer here in Atlantic Canada. And I just feel like we, we I think I've been all across Canada and throughout North America and we have some of the best trails. And I'm not saying that because I'm from North, New, uh, from Atlantic Canada. I truly believe that we have some of the best trails in all of Canada. Others, questions, comments? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to jump in there. Um, one of the things that we got to participate in this summer and I have to give kudos to the town of CBS um, for spearheading it, but we got together um, with a bunch of different trail organizations, businesses, whether that be restaurants or um, B and Bs or inns or um, the folks who do the boats and all this stuff, and we all collaborated and came up with several different itineraries for folks visiting CBS. And it's such a big community. There's so much to do. You're, you know, you have the really, ocean, I you have the trails. Julia, can you can you tell people what Conception Bay South is uh, for those that aren't from Newfoundland? Yes, exactly. That's a good point. Um, so Conception Bay South is 20 minutes outside of St. John's. Um, you're in Conception Bay, which is a gigantic and on views of Kelly Island, uh, Little Bell, and Bell Island. It's really really beautiful. Um, one of the East Coast Trail starts um, in CBS at Topsail Beach. So that's why we were a part of it. Um, but we created these itineraries where, you know, a family comes, whether it's just coming from town and you don't really know everything that's available in CBS or you're coming from Corner Brook or Bonavista, Vista, wherever, um, and you're coming to CBS for the day and you wanna do the trails, you wanna do the water and you wanna do the restaurants. So. I just have to shout out CBS for doing that and bringing all of those stakeholders together. Um, Cause not only did we come up with a really great product but we got to talk about it and hear what the ideas are. Um, and I lived in CBS and I didn't know all that was available. So it was a really great tool um, to kind of collaborate like that. So 
um, I, I, I hope to see that happen along more communities on the East Coast Trail. And that's really awesome because um, I lived in Paradise and actually lived on Topsail Bluff. So I um, was able, I looked out over uh, Conception Bay all the time and, and I actually was on the board of uh, Manuals River Center. So I, and I was out on the trail all the time and I always felt like there was a lot of opportunity to connect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good example of where a lot of times we think about small, tiny communities because they're, they're, they're very insular. They're all, it's the downtown area is very small. Um, you can connect people. CBS is a very long community. And I think that's a really great example of how you can actually have a lot of smaller communities doing it because everything's really connected, but in an area like CBS or a larger community, it's a broader area and you were still able to do it. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people will say, well, we're a big city or a, a large town and we're so dis disparate, like in terms of the, the distances and, and, and it's hard to connect. Whereas in a small community, you know, you might be next door to an outfitter, a restaurant and a hotel. Um, and so I think the idea of CBS is, is great. And I'd love to, I think this is really where I'd love to see some of these as case studies to understand where people have done these things because that's a learn, learning and a teachable opportunity to be able to say, listen, here's what CBS did. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a, there's a template already in, in place and how can you replicate that in your area? And to your point, a, a lot of people don't go past the overpass when, if they live in St. John's, you don't go past the overpass, but that got people from St. John's into, into CBS. And so that's local tourism. That's, that's bringing people from St. John's into CBS or wherever. And right now during COVID, unless the bubble opens, we're still working within our own provinces. And so we have to think about our own local residents as well. And so that's local tourism at its, you know, you know, prime example of local tourism and thinking about it. So I think that's, I love that example. And I'm so excited to see that that happened because I remember I was always had these ideas and would talk to Jennifer Lake with the town and think about what we could do. So that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So I popped, uh, I popped the link into uh, CBS's uh, sample itinerary so you can have a look. It was, I, I would really encourage you to go in there and think about these. Unfortunately, a lot of the itinerary pieces that we have on our websites, we've designed them very much for non-resident uh, a traveler. So sometimes you need, especially uh, because a lot of what we're doing is going to be very much a, you know, sort of that hyper-local approach, you know, for the most part this summer of just uh, sort of rethinking that process. And, and that's what I love about what CBS did uh, with that sample itinerary workshop or the itinerary workshop piece they did and how they build it out. You know, just things to think about because uh, all of these trailheads have become just so insanely uh, busy because people want to get out, out is, you know, thinking about, okay, where, how do I uh, tell people where they can park alternatively? So the example that Jane gave of the bike and bean, like you would be hard pressed to find parking anywhere there to to basically get onto the trail system so it's been interesting to see how um, that community has said okay if this one's full there's you know this lot that maybe people didn't know about that's just up a little ways you know on the trail system where they can park parking huge washrooms mm -hmm. probably the mm -hmm. second most thing uh, like people always wanting to know uh, you know where the washroom is and we had some issues not so much in Atlantic Canada, but in other parts of the of the country where, uh, you know, we did have some overcrowding that was taking place. And, uh, you know, we had some issues around uh, people using washrooms in places they shouldn't be using washrooms. <laughs> so yeah, just things to think about. And I'll give you this one and then I'll let, turn it over to somebody else. There was this kid and he had like an old Dickie D, uh, the one that's on the bicycle. And I don't know, you know, I, I wished I would have had my camera with me that day, but he was such a freaking, you know, genius. He got to a point where a lot of people, uh, they're not familiar with the trail. And it was lots of families that were first time bikers. And I always found that we, you know, always went too far than the kids could actually probably, you know, get back to where we were without the whining and the complaining and all of that type of stuff. He strategically placed this Dickie D uh, biking thing that he had on the trail 
And he, he was making a mint and I had to laugh. He had thought everything through because who takes money with them, but everybody had their phone, you know, and they were doing the tap on this thing that he had. It was just insane. Now I have no idea if he was legal or anything, but he was cleaning up on this trail, but simple. It was so simple. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like having a lemonade stand. You just modified a lemonade stand. <laughs> oh, it's, it's awesome. Um, but it's interesting so thinking about like the, the bathroom piece. That's where if, if, if you're in a community and there aren't any bathrooms close by, but you can develop a partnership with a business that was willing to. Um, so oftentimes I'll work with communities that have, you know, there, there's a trail, but there's a library or there's um, a recreation facility that also can be a partnership that gives people an opportunity to go and use the bathroom. Um, so if you don't initially have the ability to put um, a compostable toilet on your trail or something along those lines, look at a partnership with a recreation facility or a library that's willing to allow people to come in and maybe they fill up their water bottle and, and have the, use the bathroom there and give them directions to those things. So again, those are sort of outside the box thinking and it's not really a revenue generator, but it does keep people in the area. So there could be a spinoff and creating a more trail friendly community because I think that's the other important thing is when people come into the community, they want to feel like they're being thought of. And so they're not a second thought and, and you walk in and you need to use the bathroom, but you have to buy something at Tim Hortons or buy something. But if they knew that they could go to the library because that's a public space, um, that just makes people feel a little bit more welcome. And again, they'll probably appreciate that and go to the local shop and pick up a donut or a coffee or have a beer. So just think about some of those uh, added value things that could be just a simple partnership with somebody local that uh, wouldn't be something that you would think of otherwise. Anybody on here doing anything with their trails around festivals or events that they'd like to share? Uh, for Hike Discovery now, I mean, we didn't do it this past year because of COVID, uh, but uh, the Hike, Hike Discovery is the trail association for the Bonavista Peninsula in eastern Newfoundland. Um, so, we, and I sit on that board. Uh, so we started in a partnership uh, with Port Rexton Brewery, a, a, a running race that was called Ales for Trails. I mean, it's only a five kilometer trail, uh, but, uh, you know, people had the option to run it or they could walk another trail that was closer by, but was double the distance. And that ended up being, you know, they, they actually had to modify what was being offered in that because so many people wanted to do it. Uh, you know, originally another restaurant was partnering, but they were limited in their capacity. So that was partly limiting how many people could participate. So it's funny in some ways, it, we had to make it simpler to, to be able to, you know, get more people coming. And, you know, it wasn't, it didn't take that much. It was just a case of, you know, having security and safety for the trails. Everyone could come back to the brewery. That was when you could pack everyone in together. There was just a spread of some simple food laid out and beer, you know, you got a free beer, you got a free glass, you got a free uh, t-shirt and a band. So even if someone's coming out for them, they are still, even if everything was closed, covered when it came to uh, what to eat and drink. And they had to set it in November, the first weekend of November, uh, which originally all the businesses were like, this is ridiculous. Like, you know, we're all kind of closing down post Thanksgiving. Why not do it earlier? And they made the really good point when, you know, those who are at the core researching it said, there's a running race in Newfoundland every other weekend. So there's no point in us sticking it on to, you know, you're looking for a specific clientele, uh, but really it ended up extending our season by another week. Like, you know, a weekend that typically no one would be interested in booking or staying. You would have all these vacation homes and big groups coming out and doing it together. Um, so, you know, we look forward to being able to get back to that, but, you know, that was one of the biggest generators for the trails association um, to generate money for, what they were doing for the trails and then actually further benefited a lot of the other businesses and some started staying open a little bit longer for that and then we also had a yoga festival at the beginning that started off the season in early may uh, and once again just because of covid that didn't happen it might happen this year but uh you know those were fairly simple things that didn't take way too much planning and infrastructure and organization that were pulled off quite well thank you that's awesome Ooh. And you talk about revenue generator for the trail organizations. One of the things, and I don't know whether, uh, I've got a couple of different slides. Oh, here. 
Uh, one of the things that I thought would be really kind of neat too is, um, so revenue generated for trail organizations, it becomes quite difficult for trails to actually re generate revenue. And so some of the things that I've talked to with groups is either doing themed meals where, you know, there could be, so, you know, there's like Halifax Taco Week here in St. John, we have Chop Chop and like Chop Chop money goes to um, the food banks. And so there could be something that you could do a themed meal week where you partner with local businesses and they could do a themed meal and it could be for proceeds that go back to your trail or themed beer. So again, so there's, there's opportunities for those trail groups to actually benefit and, and from partnering with some of these businesses to create some great, great opportunities. And I love that Ales and Trails and, you know, obviously, you know, at Port Rexton Brewery, we've spent a lot of time there. It's a great spot. And, but I think you're right. Like there's, there's that other element too, is to supporting the work of the trail groups and partnering with businesses so that you can generate some revenue because these trails need to be upkept. And so there's that opportunity too. And it creates really a lot of fun and, and, and enthusiasm. And, you know, that was a great, and I think too, trails are a great opportunity to get people there in the off season. So that weekend in November was really smart. You could do something in the spring that gets people there before things start, uh, start up for the spring. So that's a really cool. I love that idea. It was interesting. Um, I don't know if it was one of the missions we were on or my, one of my travel pieces, but uh, we were in Vail and Vail, Colorado, and then Beaver Creek, Colorado. And it was interesting how they work with the local businesses to support the trail development piece. So the way they do it, so they've got a, a nonprofit group that's set up as a charitable uh, component in, in every one of the hotels that participates in this. It's a voluntary piece um, where you can actually make a donation to, to the trail system. And when the person was uh, you know, talking to us about this, it was more so about um, allowing the person first off to be out on the trail and have that emotional connection to it. And what she was saying was, you know, I think it was like one in eight end up doing some sort of donation after their, their um, experience out on the trail. Once again, the partnership with the hotels, it's, it's taken there. Um, then it's transferred back to the nonprofit group who issues the, if it's a certain amount, the, the tax uh, receipt for it. I thought, you know, it's like, not that I'm, um, I'm saying go and build all of these things, but it's just interesting how you can think of different ways of, of creating mechanisms to fund these things. I mean, our, our de facto approach is generally government-based funding for lots of these things. Um, I think at, in times it holds us back as well, you know, because I think what Jane has shown us is you know, lots of these things we can go out business to business, organization to organization to partner and collaborate on to, to get moving and, and to really get some things, you know, in place, especially I, to me, there's an incredible opportunity because of the pandemic to, I think, capitalize on this newfound push that you're seeing. That's a reason why, you, as Jane said, you can't get a bicycle hardly anywhere. Even used ones are hard to come by. Uh, equipment and things like that. It's it's in when you go to the trailheads on the weekends, they're they're jam packed. So, you know, what's the opportunity there from a business standpoint and community to enhance that and, and do some incredible things this summer? Hi, it's Hillary in Colchester County in Nova Scotia. I just wanted to make a comment. I guess when we're thinking about partnering um, or if a business or another entity is thinking about uh, promoting a trail or partnering, um, it's, I think it's important to keep in mind who is operating or managing that trail. So if it's, for example, a volunteer trail group, it would be um, important to connect with them before you're doing any um, you know, promotion or offering a meal, whatever the case may be, I think to, to get people, um, more people using that trail or promoting that trail in any way. And the reason I'm bringing it up is that of course now, as you mentioned, Jonathan, we're seeing so much more trail use and that impacts the trail, the condition of the trail, those people who are volunteering for the most part to operate and manage the trail. So um, we would just want to be doing something that is not going to cause more 
harm or problem to to uh, their kind of operation. Uh, you had mentioned before, like the issues with parking, right? So they're the ones who would be trying to manage, you know, the parking lots that they may be responsible for, or, um, you know, that's just kind of one example, but just to kind of throw that out there as a consideration, just to make sure you're connecting with whoever is operating that particular trail, whether it's a volunteer group or um, a municipality or another level of government. Thanks. Great. Great points to think about. Um, you know, we've seen just in the last year, once again, um, because we didn't, you know, we, we probably weren't exceeding our carrying capacity uh, on a lot of these trails. And then all of a sudden we were exceeding them in, in certain areas. I'll give you an example, the, the Blue Mountain Reserve, uh, just, you know, in Halifax, uh, the, the people in the communities that you need to drive through to get into that were just, overrun because you, you were parking way down the road but then we what we were seeing was how do you change people's behaviors because people were going off the trails and making their own trails through the woods that were then eroding and causing runoff issues and all these types of things so there's certain things you need to you know we're talking really about this opportunity on the business side but you still have to marry it with the the ecological impact that you're you're trying to deal with when you have increased numbers um, you know, and also, I love what you're saying, Hillary, about understanding what this trail means to the community from a recreational, healthy living kind of perspective without losing that specialness uh, by being overrun by, uh, you know, people that might be coming into the community. So really good points. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right, Hillary. I mean, on understanding how trails are managed, particularly in Nova Scotia, because it is, it is a volunteer initiative in a lot of the areas. I think one of the things that I really encourage groups to do is to part, you know, this is a partnership, there's a relationship that should be built. Um, and so this is sort of the non traditional model of trails. And I think this is how trails are evolving is that a lot of times we've just seen it being volunteer driven and having volunteer groups start to expand and reach out to businesses, but businesses starting to reach out so that we can create these partnerships. So it's not just a partnership between business and business, it's a partnership and relationship that's developed between the trail organizations and the businesses and services in the area so that you create a more holistic approach to trails in your communities, because I think that has been a huge gap. And I think where Jonathan was talking too about you know, the idea that we could start looking at opportunities to expand beyond the government funding model if trail organizations can partner with businesses to make sure that businesses are respecting and understanding the, the impact their potential um, promotion could have on the trail, but also from a positive and negative perspective, you can start creating these unique opportunities. And I, you know, I know I know a lot, even before the pandemic, when I was doing work for Trans Canada Trail and working with a lot of these hiking groups, the biggest concern for them was, well, if we become part of the Trans Canada Trail, that's going to increase the human impact on our trail. And we need to make sure that we respect the, the, the ecological impact and, and, and environmental impact on that trail. And so we want to make sure that we're not, uh, that these trails are, are you know, not being damaged by, by increased usage and, and, you know, that we're not doing more damage than good. So I think that's a really, really good point. And I would encourage, encourage groups to start thinking about partnerships and, and it's great and it's wonderful to have that idea that I want to support the trail, but, you know, you want to have that conversation and relationship with those trail groups to make sure that they're comfortable um, and that, you know, they, that, that the impact, because they know what kind of impact increase usage is going to have on their trails. And actually I do a CBC column here on Information Morning in St. John for, for this part of the province. And I'm actually doing a session, uh, my segment on Friday is going to be about um, the impact of trail usage and, um, and how we can start mitigating some of the impact usage. Yes. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with, um, there's a, a an organization not for profit called Park Pass that was piloted in BC and then uh, I think they've done some pilots in Toronto. Uh, Hike Discovery and Gross Warren's actually been in some conversations with them just regarding whether or not there is potential for a partnership. But Park Pass was created because BC was having these problems of 
everyone wanting to go to the same one popular park, it being completely overcrowded, and then there being all these other parks that were, um, you know, parks with trails that were empty. So they created a system where you'd have to pre-register to hike and you'd have to pick a time, but the system could also determine, like you could say, you know, 100 people on this trail is really max level, uh, you know, 50 is kind of so-so and, and below 50 is light. So when you're going to register, it might actually say, you know, hey, this trail is already over capacity. So you can either pick a different time or here are some other trails in the area or parks in the area that you might want to visit instead. So if you're stuck with that time, these are the other options. And it was a really great initiative to help people um, realize that there are other trails around and also uh, generate, uh, it, it helps solve the parking issue too, because you were able to pre-register for your parking spot. Uh, and a lot of this was done by, you know, scanners would let you in, it could scan your part, your uh, driver's license or your, um, your plate uh, and let you in, you know, you would, there would be some form of human uh, HR required to, to process all this, but for them, it was a really good program for kind of creating more awareness and preventing that issue. And then when COVID hit, they piloted it in Toronto to be able to let um, uh, essential workers be the only ones who could register to go into parks at the time when these parks are closed for mental health requirements and keep those numbers down. Um, and something that we did in our own business when it came to, uh, I run an inn in Trinity, when it came to the shoulder season, one of our big issues was, you know, people look at everything, they said, well, the theater's closed, you know, the, the whale watching's done, whatever, like there's nothing to do. So even if they were thinking about coming at, at most, they'd be like, well, we'll go for one day just so we, we can say we've been there or see it and that's it. So we started writing three-day itineraries where we just pulled in all the trails from the region, kind of wrote the, the story of how you would weave your way through it. And, uh, and then also kind of sprinkle in, you know, hey, on these particular days, if you happen to be here, you can grab a beer at the Fort Western Brewery. You know, you can grab a sandwich here. Uh, this one particular not-for-profit up in Monta Vista happens to be open. Um, and that actually led to a really big increase for us of people booking for two to three nights in the shoulder season versus just one night because they knew that regardless of whether or not the other activities decided to open, um, they, they already understood that they'd have something to do. So it took the pressure off because in the past we would partner with things like the theater and then our guests would show up and the theater would have to say, oh, we only have five people in the audience so we're canceling. And you'd have people who drove all the way to come out for a night of dinner and theater. Uh, and you understand why the other organization is doing that. They have to make sure they're protecting themselves financially. So trails was a really good way for us to key in on something that was super dependable. And when we sold the package, we just said, you know, three nights will include your dinner, but we'll also include your trail maps and the money from the trail maps would go to the trails. So at least the trails would make a little bit of money every time we sold one of these packages. Love it. And just to your point too, the first the first segment or column I did for CBC was actually because the trails in this area were being overrun. And so they said, Jane, can you provide us with five trails in southwestern or southeastern New Brunswick, southwestern New Brunswick, that are lesser known so that people can start going to these places? Because you're right. Like, so that was that was the first column I did was just like, okay, not everyone has to go to St. John, uh, the Irving Nature Park or Rockwood Park. People can go to Nature Trust Preserve or this little known trail and, and be respectful of the trail. But I love that idea of creating those packages and, and getting people and giving them, giving and selling the maps to be able to generate revenue and giving them something to something tangible for them to do. And I think I love the way that you've capitalized on it. And I'm just all of them, I'm sitting here going, I want all these best practices because I think these are just so incredible and start sharing these best practices because like the CBS one, your, your ideas, it's fantastic. I threw up the uh, link in the chat room, everyone to the park pass project. Um, and, you know, it's definitely something you should have a look at. Um, we, as you know, as she said, we were looking at it in gross morn um, and, you know, we had, gotten down to we were almost uh, going to to go with it but um, we're still studying uh, to see you know if it was something that we could have rolled out you know sort of provincially or even pan atlantic uh, it's an interesting it is a very interesting tool as far as managing people and the linkages that you can do with it are, are incredible the other piece i put in there 
um, was, you know, and Jane and I talked about this and, you know, uh, you know, much of what we're concentrating on here is sort of these terrestrial based uh, trails systems, but we also talked about marine based uh, uh, pieces as well. I just put a link into um, the Kawarthas Northumberland area and some of you have been with me on best practices up to Peterborough area before, but uh, there's a great piece in there on the um, how they took trail towns and applied it to a, a marine context using the Trent Severn waterway system. But in Atlantic Canada, uh, we also have incredible waterways that um, lend themselves to this whole sort of trail concept. I mean, if you look at, you know, New Brunswick with the Tobique, uh, with the St. John River, you know, with the St. Croix waterway system, you know, incredible pieces, Nova Scotia with the Tobiatic Mercy River, you know, approach and, and just the rivers in, in Cape Breton, you know, and then of course all of the ponds and, and, and rivers in Newfoundland and Labrador. There is, you know, things to think through and opportunities on, on that side as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting if you go, if you want to have a look at what they've done, and how they've applied this sort of trail town concept to their um, uh, Trent Severn waterway, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool little uh, project that they have. I shouldn't say little, it's a very big <laughs> project that they have on the go, but. Anybody else have other comments, questions they want to ask? I'm curious about um, just uh, um, conversations, I guess, initi initiating conversations with business owners from the trail groups, like a volunteer trail group perspective um, with, yeah, so I guess first a comment, a lot of trail groups, volunteer trail groups, they're so focused on managing and operating the trail, they're yeah. not necessarily, they may not have, you know, the skill set around their, their table to um, or the time or energy to kind of be looking for that, the business side of things and those business opportunities. So I'm just curious, um, realizing that it's kind of, you know, there's, there's benefit both ways. Um, how would a group, do you have tips on how a group would kind of initiate a conversation with a business or a business group in an area um, to, kind of sell <laughs> sell it to them you know that they're they're benefiting from the trail being here can can we as a trail group get a little bit back whether it's a percentage of something or donation or something like that uh, I can just speak for hike discovery the, the way we worked and our our trail network was very kind of thought out it kind of started with Skirwink trail being created but there there was a very conscient conscious effort from ACOA and uh, and our government and our community to kind of build this trail system out. So I don't know if this is possible for trail systems that already exist, but we actually designed our board that our board is um, a municipality rep. So someone who sits on the town council of the trail, like one of the trails in the network and a business rep. So a business has to represent that trail on the board as well as someone from the municipality who can also make decisions um with regards to you know what can be done in spending uh because our trail association you actually have to pay in the the municipalities have to pay in two thousand dollars each per year to have their trail under our under the hike discovery banner um and then money generated through um donations and stuff gets put towards that too but uh, and then all the the net the the work that gets on the trail is done there but that's been really good for us because our board is so focused on how we can make this work for the community and the businesses and the municipalities um, that that's kind of intrinsically tied in already. But like I said, once again, um, it's tough if you already have your boards or organizations not set up like that. So I just recommend if, if there is board, uh, maybe look at the bylaws and, and make it so that there has to be someone sitting on that board, one or two people from businesses or organizations that can help kind of spread the message out uh, to to the uh, to the businesses and the community there. And I think I'll build on that because that's that's the way. So when I'm working with groups now, I take like I said a more holistic approach, and I've seen. So I, again, I go back to the Nova Scotia model. You've got such great volunteers, and I think about like uh, Jerry McClellan, and you know when all the work that he's done and. 
and think about all the hard work and 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 the frustration and 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 because it's not um, the other stuff just wasn't their their bailiwick. And so what I'm trying to work do with uh, work with groups is to say, how do we create a better complement of people so that the people that want to build trail are able to focus on building the trail and the people that want to create the trail as a product to develop the trail as a product are there to be able to to have those conversations. And so I worked with the Island Trails to develop an engagement program so that they've got the tools and the right people to be able to go have those conversations. But you know, it really does require a different skill set and a different group of people, unless they're given the tools. And I, I like the idea of having the business sector engaged. And it's really just sort of flipping the model. And I think there is an evolution from a trail organization perspective where you've got the trail builders. And then as the trail is built and developed, you move into creating a different set of volunteers um, that are a little bit more uh, that are more interested and engaged in having those conversations and I really do believe having members of the business sector involved whether it's somebody from your business improvement area so I know for example um, I'm just involved with our business improvement area here and I think they just a, did a shout out to the new one in Turo so maybe you get that person who's the rep from the BIA to sit on your board and then they're the ones that are able to go have the conversation with the business sector or maybe there's somebody from the Chamber of Commerce that could join the board. So it's not necessarily that board person who's the trail builder that has to have the conversation. It's someone who sits on the board, understands the value and benefits of the trail that can go and talk to their own, um, their counterparts. So, um, and then there's, there are also some tools that I can share with you, Hillary, in terms of just some speaking points and things that I've worked with groups on. But I think you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work in the volunteers are exhausted and it's just not something that they're interested in because they're, they're they're trying to maintain their trail and they want to get out and build trail or hike on trail and it's just so maybe hand it off to somebody who is more interested in having that conversation and building a more holistic and, and robust group of people to support the broader trail. Anyone else have points, comments, questions they want to ask? I mean, I really appreciate that that point, Hillary, in, in regards to how do you have those conversations with, with business. Sometimes we have to help um, the businesses understand their customer as well. 99% uh, of the time, the customer, uh, because of this incredible experience they've had on the trail system, has no problem as part of, I don't want to call it surcharges or whatever, but it's almost like a trail user style um, uh, give back. So there's ways of communicating what you're doing as a business and your commitment to the protection, preservation, um, you know, so that this trail is, is here, you know, for, for a very, very long time. I think those are the types of things that we, you know, sometimes need to work with, with our, our, our business community. I think it also helps tell that, that story around the community commitment to the trail. Um, you know, that's what I always loved about the Appalachian Trail is like when you go down there, you, you know, it's people have committed a lifetime and they go out and they freely are giving it's very similar to what we do, um, you know, but it, it just seems to be promoted so, so, uh, so much more, I guess, than, than, than what we do. I think we need to really be proud of what we have and what Jane had talked about earlier is how do we collectively bring this together to really optimize the opportunity that it's right there in front of us. We just need to collectively, I think, come together. We're all, you know, we all have these incredible examples that we've been sharing today. It would be, you know, just ideal for all of us to be able to learn from one another how do we pull these things together? How do we create some, some standard practices and policies that could be used across the Atlantic? Um, you know, so we are not building the same thing 20 times over, you know? Uh, so, you know, it's funny, you know, Jane and I've had these types of, of conversations for a long, long time, but I, I think we're, we're at this stage where there's just this incredible opportunity and, you know, how do we, how do we reach out and grab it is, you know, is the question that we, we really need to answer. We have great product and we've got great, you know, there's little pockets of things happening everywhere. And I just, you know, having, you know, I work in the industry and I, I'm a consultant, I work with different groups, but you know, I, 
I've been to the Bonavista Vista Peninsula. I didn't know about hike discovery. And I think what you're doing is great. And I think that there's a great, there's things to learn from that. And I think that if we can share that kind of information with each other, we can build on it and not reinvent the wheel. And I think Jonathan and I, I'm sure are gonna have a conversation after this about how we can start to share that information. And, and you know, Hillary, to your point, like what are some things, you know, to the business, you know, who is the trail user? What kind of impact they're going to have? And why as a business would I want to be engaged with the trail community? Here's a couple of speaking points. Um, and, and that'll, you know, you can take it to those businesses. If you're not able to engage them to sit on your board, here's a couple of little things that you can do to sell them on the idea and say, these people are willing to spend money in your community and you need to support the product that we've got here because that's what people are coming for. People are not coming for a crystal palace, people are not coming for, you know, they're coming to explore what we have here because we have such a natural and wonderful product. And so those business operators and services in those communities need to capitalize on that and support all the good work that the trail builders and uh, volunteers do. And I did a whole segment last week on CBC about volunteers. The feedback and comment I got from that was, wow, I didn't believe the volunteers did so much work. I didn't believe that volunteers ran 90% of the trails in the province of New Brunswick because most people thought they were run by municipalities. And now that people understand that they're supported by volunteers, people are starting to say, what can we do and how can we help? And so I think that's where the business community can step in and support all the great work that your trail volunteers are doing. So yeah, I think there's lots more to come. Jane, thank you very much. Uh, incredible presentation. And thanks everyone else for all your comments and sharing, uh, you know, what you're doing in your communities. Like I learned so much today. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I put a bunch of stuff in, in the post. Don't be surprised. Uh, we might reach out to you guys and gals to uh, ask a few more questions and see if people are interested in carrying on this conversation. Cause you know, I'd love to be able to uh, as, as I said, you know, sort of look at this opportunity and, and how we might be able to work together, um, you know, going into the summer, but also into the future as well. So I should have the recording up uh, later today. If you want to uh, share it with others, feel free to. Um, our next two sessions, they're, they're sold out. Uh, for those of you who are able to get into them, the next one's on risk management. Then our last one is on uh, pivoting partnerships uh, with Atlantic Lottery Corporation and uh, the Cavendish Beach Festival. So a really cool one. I think uh, that's going to be a lot of fun as well. Jane, thanks. And well, thank uh, you. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. It was great to meet you all.